Well, good morning, everybody. Would you stand and join us as we worship this morning? for hanging in there with me. Um, I just pray that as we continue worshiping that you'll just open your heart to what the Lord has for you this morning in this service. And um, as Pam continues to lead us, just uh, worship with a, with a heart of gladness for what the Lord has done and what he's doing.
be seated. Welcome to Grace Point. If you're new or visiting with us, we encourage you to fill out a connection card, which can be found in the back of the seat in front of you. Fill out as much information as you're comfortable with. You can turn the card in at the end of service at our Welcome Center, and we will have a gift for you as a gesture of thanks for being here. Or you can wait until later in the service and place the card in the offering bag as it passes by. and said, today is the day to get working for Jesus. Well, Kat, I'm excited that you're willing to, to get some things done. That's right. I am that girl. <laughs> I'm telling you what. Kat, um, I, I'd like to actually get started, and, and let's go do... Uh, Kat, what are you sitting for? Like, you said you're ready to take action. Yeah, but this is where I always sit. Uh, I'm, I'm going to need more than that. Oh, I know what you're getting at, Jesus. Okay, how much do you want? Fifty dollars? Is that enough? That's not what I meant. Oh, a hundred then. You drive a hard bargain. <laughs> All right. There you go. But you might not want to cash that until next Friday, if you know what I'm saying. Kat, listen, I, I think it's nice that you want to give and all, but listen... I, I want you to mentor a younger woman. Ah, oh, yeah. Well, you see, um, Jesus, I don't really get into teaching people and stuff. That's not really my kind of thing. Okay. Um, you know the woman at work, uh, Amy? Yeah. Um, I need you to take her out to lunch and just tell her about me. Oh, yeah. Well, you see, Amy's, like, different. Uh, like really different, you know? I know. <laughs> but she needs to know about me. Oh, I know. I'll tell the people at church to call her. They get paid to do things like that. 
Kat, no, you, I don't think you understand. Like, I want you to do that. Yeah, well, you see, Jesus, I'm not really comfortable doing things like that. You know, Kat, the problem is you're too comfortable. Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. The kids are running out because they know I'm about to speak, so <laughs> good choice. Yes, that's right. Do you know me? I don't think so. Well, listen, some of you already know what's underneath this coat, but I'm going to make it abundantly clear today. So, <laughs> I think that's the most applause I've ever gotten in my life. So, hey, it's good to be here with you. Uh, Pastor Kevin and Pastor Liz, your worship leader, they are up at Lebanon this morning while you have me here. Uh, so I'm really grateful to have this opportunity. And I know Pastor Kevin is really grateful for the opportunity to be up at Lebanon this morning. And so we welcome you into our service as well. Um, I had a great time just worshiping this morning. Uh, I don't get to do that with my wife very often. Uh, and so I'm grateful uh, for the opportunity that we had to just be together in worship today. Um, it's always a nice kind of filling up before I come and just pour everything out. Um, but it's good. We're in the middle of a, a sermon series. So if this is your first Sunday here with us, I want to welcome you. Um, I'm Pastor Chris. I'm our Lebanon campus pastor. Uh, and once in a while, uh, for whatever reason, I get invited back here uh, to preach um, and so uh, it's always good for me. It's like a little bit of a homecoming. Uh, and so today uh, I get to, to feel a little bit more at home today. Um, we are in a sermon series called The Battle is the Lord's. And today is about the halfway point through that series. Uh, and so if you've been tracking with us, and hopefully you have, uh, we are talking about things in our lives that need to fall. Uh, these giants that we have uh, you know, addiction, uh, there's uh, comfort, there's all of these things in our lives that, that keep us away from being fully invested in what God has in store for us. And so this morning, I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17 as we uh, prepare to dive into the message today. Uh, but first, let me uh, invite us to pray together this morning. God, you are good. Uh, and as the words echo in my mind this morning, you're never going to let us down. No matter what life throws at us, no matter what we get ourselves into, no matter what our circumstances are, no matter what needs to be removed from our lives, God, you are good and you will never fail us. Uh, and so, Lord, my prayer this morning is that as we go through uh, this time together, God, would you remind us of that? Would you remind us of your goodness? And would you remind us of your faithfulness? And may your spirit just stir in us in a fresh way this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. So from November 21st, 2006 until November 20th, 2012, I served in the United States Air Force. Uh, it was a time in my life, look at that, I had hair. Well, I think I thought I had hair. It's still not really there, but it's, it's there a little bit. I was in the military in a time in my life where I had no direction, no idea what I was doing. My life was a complete train wreck. And the military did things for me that probably saved my life, probably saved a lot of my relationships. And so I'm grateful for that. And once I settled into the military, I began to excel. Uh, I was good at my job. I enjoyed the military life. I enjoyed what the military life afforded me. Um, I mean, you know, just being honest, 
by the time I made staff sergeant, I was making good money and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed having little responsibility and being able to basically do whatever I wanted. That was the life. And about three and a half years into my six year enlistment, God got a hold of my life. And I started to live with a new enthusiasm, with a new direction. One where my partying began to disappear and it was replaced with actual meaningful relationships. I began finding a new sense of purpose. Jess and I got connected to a church out there. I started to kind of find my passion for worship ministry uh, under the mentorship of Shannon, who's the worship leader at Hope Church, who I just adore. She meant so much to my life. In my mind, I had reached this place where I was living this perfect scenario where I had one foot in this military lifestyle world and one foot in the church. So I could live both ways and things felt good. But then God spoke because one foot in is just not enough. I was entering into my window of re-enlistment and I had no doubt what I was going to do. I mean, who could pass up being able to retire at 40 with a guaranteed income, with some of the best benefits that you could ever ask for? My college was paid for. It just made sense. Jess and I were very close with people in our church out there. But then my plans started to unravel. The deeper that I went with Jesus, the more I could sense that nudging in my heart that he was calling me away from the military completely and fully into ministry. You know, logically, it feels like one of the most ridiculous decisions I've ever made in my entire life. And I've made a lot of ridiculous decisions. Uh, I try to put it out of my mind as much as I could, but when God wants something done, he's going to do whatever he needs to do to knock some sense into us. Uh, And so my wife was a big part of, of that sense being knocked into me. God spoke to both of us and just at different times and just shared with us, this is, this is the path. This is the way that I have to go. This is what's next in my life. God, you want me to leave all of this behind, this life that I've built. I finally found direction. I finally found some purpose. I'm finally not a disappointment to most people. You want me to leave all that behind and move back to a place that I despise, move back to a place I never want to go back to with no income, no place to live, no job, no idea what's next. Yeah, I do. (laughs) But life, life was comfortable. Why would I want to leave that? See, comfort in and of itself is not a terrible thing. It's not even a sinful thing. We like things that bring us comfort, right? some, Some of us like things to have their order, and that brings us comfort. Some of us like coming home at the end of a long day of work, knowing that we can sit on our couch and watch some Phillies play off baseball. That brings us comfort and an interesting level of anxiety, but still comfort. There's still comfort there. Some of us, um, most of us that are parents, we find comfort when the kids go to sleep at night and we finally have peace and quiet in the house. Those things bring comfort. But comfort is not the goal. See, that's where we get into trouble. If comfort becomes our aim, if comfort becomes our pursuit, if comfort becomes what we're living for, then it turns sinful. Because then we start to miss out. We start to become inattentive to what God has for us. So let's look back at the story in 1 Samuel 17. And we're going to start at verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sako in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes-Demim between Soko and Azekah. 
Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another, with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and his iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. And then if you jump down to verse 16, For 40 days the Philistine came forward and every evening and took his stand. So here we have the, the, the army, the Israelite army, preparing for war against the Philistine army. And they have their, their weapons, they have their encampment, they have their rations, they have their armor, they have their war cries. They have everything on their side, including the Lord. And yet, they're frozen. This one giant that's standing in the way of their victory, and they're frozen. And for 40 days this goes on. That's a lot of time to slip into comfort. That's a lot of time to just say, nah, I'm good here. Someone's bringing me food later. I've got a place to sleep. I'm going to live another day. It's okay. They had been defeated without ever even facing their adversary. See, how many times do we see the battle right in front of us and say, nah, that's not for me. Somebody else will take care of that. We have God's promises in Scripture over and over telling us, fear not, I am with you. I have the victory. The battle is mine. And yet we are paralyzed and can't step up to the giant that's right in front of us. And we take a step back and ultimately we walk away. See, there are a few things that keep us in our comfort and out of our calling. Here's a couple that you might resonate with this morning. Logic keeps us in our comfort. Logic says if I can't see the path forward, I'm not going to take it. Logic says if I'm not equipped to do it, then I can't. Logic says if this is going to require a lot of sacrifice, I can't afford it. Logic says... If I can't get to, from point A to point B on my own, no thanks. God must not really be calling me to that. And so we push the nudging of the Holy Spirit out of our minds, and we miss an opportunity. We're reading this book as a staff right now called The Circle Maker. And uh, the author, Mark Batterson, he says this about our logic. He says, our left-brained approach is a wrong-brained approach because it's based on our limited resources rather than on God's unlimited provisions. Let me read that again. Our left-brained approach is a wrong-brained approach because it's based on our limited resources instead of God's unlimited provisions. The thought of looking foolish keeps us in our comfort. Let me tell you something. I have no problem looking foolish. Right? No problem. I hear some amens out there. A few years ago, I was with a group of friends, and uh, we went to Hershey Park for a Christmas candy lane. And uh, it was a cold December night. Had our hot chocolate. And we, they had some rides open, believe it or not. 
That's actually half the fun is going on rides when it's, you know, 10 degrees out. Uh, and, and so we're in line for one of these rides. And we've been in, there was a long line. We've been in line a little while. And I looked down on the ground at one point and I see a piece of chocolate on the ground. And it was part of a larger piece of chocolate at some point in its life. Uh, no idea how long it had been there, but it looked like it had been a little abused. And Jay Zollers, I remember he looked at that piece of chocolate and he looked at me and he said, you won't eat that. And I said, oh, yes, I will. And so I picked that chocolate right off the ground. And with the biggest smile on my face, I ate that whole thing. And then I looked at my wife and she's doing what she's doing right now. And she's cringing. And for the next hour, at least, she didn't even talk to me. Full disclosure, we actually had an argument on the way home because of that. <laughs> like, that's how serious this was to her, that I did this. I'll do anything within reason for a laugh. But it's, it's, it's looking foolish sometimes. We, we get this idea in our minds, what are people going to think if they see me doing that? What are people going to think if I tell them, God's calling me into ministry, I need to sell my business, I need to leave this job. I need to leave this life so that I can focus on what God wants. I need to give up drinking. I need to start tithing. I need to do this. And we feel like I'm going to look like such a fool when my friends or my coworkers find out. Let me ask you this, though. How foolish is it for us to come in here and sing songs about a Savior who bled and suffered and died out of discomfort for our sake? And yet we can't find ourselves able to move out of our comfort for His. Failure keeps us in our comfort. Whether from past experience or just the thought of failing, we can be paralyzed by failure. Oftentimes, we don't even get to see the fruit of our labor in ministry. And that can be viewed as failure. But several years ago, our district superintendent, Pastor Kerry Willis, he said this to me. He said, sometimes God calls us to plow rocks, and sometimes God calls us to plow good soil. Sometimes the call is not pretty. Sometimes it's downright ugly. Sometimes it takes more than we think we have in us to give. But we have to clear the rocks out of the way so that we can watch God do something beautiful with the good soil. See, when we allow these things, failure, logic, foolishness, when we allow those thoughts to get in the way of what God wants us to do, to get in the way of us stepping out of our comfort, we are denying the fullness of the victory of Christ to be realized in our lives. When God presents you with a life-changing opportunity and you feel that stirring of the Holy Spirit inside of you, and you have no doubt that going down that road is going to alter the course of your finances, your relationships, your job, your life, you can either hang on and you can trust Him and His unlimited provisions, or you can step back. You can miss an opportunity to be a part of the hand grabbing lost souls and connecting them to a merciful Father. The goal of this life is not to seek a life of comfort and settle in it. The goal is to point people to the Savior who bled and died and rose again for every one of them and every one of us, by whatever means 
we're called to do that by. See, when we get out of our comfort and we take that first step by faith, the glory of God is already being revealed. Have you ever witnessed the power of God on full display in your life? If you have, then you know, you know there is no cost too great to make his name and his glory known. Our church has a mission statement. It's pretty easy to remember. It's love God, life together, light your world. It's going to be really hard to live out that mission from a place of comfort. See, because the enemy likes to use our comfort to separate us from those things. I'm going to go backwards, light your world. The enemy uses our comfort to separate us from ministry. See, there's, there's someone more skilled than me to do that. I've done this whole raising kids thing. I'm not into watching somebody else's kids. It's on a Sunday night and the Eagles are playing Dallas. We already know who's going to win anyway. That's a pretty rough area. I don't think I can stomach seeing poverty. And I really am worried about my car. It just makes me nervous. The enemy uses our comfort to separate us from community. I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. I'm just going to watch online this week and next week and for the next six months. I don't think there's other guys in the Bible study who even really want to get to know me or even care if I'm there or not. A life group? I do not have time for a life group. None of them meet when I want them to anyways. And the enemy uses our comfort to separate us from Jesus. Yeah. I don't really think this whole God thing's working out for me. I'm just not there yet. And I'm young. I've got time. I'll make a decision later. I can do more once my kids are out of the house. I'm not really ready to give this thing up in my life yet. I know it's not really benefiting me. In fact, it's probably hurting me. But it's what I know. I can't give it up yet. I'll tithe when it makes sense to. In his book, Goliath Must Fall, Lou Giglio makes the statement that faith thrives in holy discomfort. What does he mean by that? Well, we can get a pretty clear picture of that if we look at Hebrews 11, right? That's called the the faith in action, the heroes of the Bible chapter. And the writer of Hebrews talks at length about those who were moved from a place of comfort into their discomfort and the extraordinary things God did through them when they obeyed. By faith, Noah built an ark. That's ridiculous. By faith, Abraham moved to the middle of the desert and settled in it. That's dumb. By faith, he took his son up a mountain to be sacrificed, believing that God would raise his child from the dead. That's crazy. Moses led the Israelites out of slavery and across the Red Sea and the Jordan River. That's not fathomable. And then he starts at verse 32. And he writes, And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became more powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. 
since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. See, God will use you where you're at if you allow him. But it's gonna get uncomfortable. Resisting sin is uncomfortable. Surrendering the dead things in our lives are uncomfortable. Sharing the gospel with a friend, with a coworker, with a family member is rarely comfortable. Accountability is uncomfortable. Answering the call to take the gospel to the ends of the earth comes with a price. But God gives us a promise of peace. See, in John 14, 26 to 27, it says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me, in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. See, we hear these verses over and over. The longer you're in church, the longer you're a Christian, you're going to hear these verses. They're pretty common. But do we really believe them? Do we really take them to heart that when the Holy Spirit nudges us when God calls on us, do we really believe this? That God's going to give us peace? That God is going to be with us? That God will teach us and equip us when we're called? Or are we just equating peace with our level of comfort? See, peace is when we trust him that when he calls us out of the boat, he's not going to let us down. Our lives on this earth are but a blip in the eyes of eternity. We cannot confuse abundant living with possessions and materialistic things and a good, comfortable life when abundant living is laid out for us in Romans 6, 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. That's the call of the Christian life, to die with Christ, but also to live with him. If you remember the story of the rich young ruler, he chose his earthly comfort. He chose his earthly kingdom. He chose his earthly possessions over this incredible gift of eternity in a kingdom that would never die, in a kingdom that will never be shaken, in a kingdom that will never pass. Are you having a rich young ruler moment in your life? Or have you ever had one? where you can't fathom letting go of something in your life that you might think is extremely valuable, but in reality, in the grand scheme of eternity, it means absolutely nothing. And for whatever the reason is, you just can't let go. You can't jump into what God's calling you to with both feet because you have this anchor, you have this dead Thing you're dragging around in your life and you just can't let go of it because it's comfortable. I shared with you that I reached a place where I had everything in my life that I thought I wanted. But it wasn't what God wanted. I was doing things for the kingdom, but it wasn't enough. I was serving, but it was on my time. That's not enough. 
I served when it worked my schedule and I had things in my life that still needed to die. So God called me away. God called me away from everything I had built for myself. Me, 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 me. God called me away from it. And he brought me here. And I spent nine years in ministry at a place I fought as hard as I could to never go back to. That's discomfort. But if I hadn't done that, I would have missed so much of what God had for my life and hopefully for the lives of some people around me. I would have missed out. I would have missed out on adopting my daughter. But it still wasn't enough. There were still things in my life over those nine years that still needed to die. And so God called me away again. And just this past week, I celebrated a year at Lebanon already. And all the things that God is doing there, it's incredible. There's a, a family up there, a church family, who has taken Jess and I in. And we're a community up there now. And we're doing things for the kingdom. And I'm watching God do incredible things through the families that are coming. But if I don't watch out, if I don't continue to trust, if I don't continue to lean in, if I don't continue to just keep plowing forward through rocks, I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss what God has. And I don't know when, and I don't know what it's going to look like, but someday God's going to call me to something else. And I have to trust him. And someday God might call you out of this seat, out of this room, out of this town. And he's going to ask you to leave everything you've built. Because in the eye of eternity, nothing that we build matters. I've been here before and I know what God's peace is and I know and I want you to know that you can trust him and he's going to provide well, that's easy for you to say from the platform but how am I supposed to just let go how am I supposed to just trust God it's not easy the dead things I needed to shed from my life have come with a cost. But it's worth it because he let his son go. He let his only son face the brutality, the torture, the violence, the wrath of the cross so that the hand of the lost could be reclaimed and reconnected with the hand of grace. And through the resurrection of Jesus, we too can have life, abundant life. Don't be fooled by the comforts this world has to offer. I think one of the most uncomfortable things that we have is right here in this room. You know what it is? It's the altars. This is a place where we can get on our knees and invite the Lord into the battle. Not only that, but this is one of the most uncomfortable places because we're publicly inviting the Lord into the battle. That's enough to freeze us. And I don't think that you're not coming to the altar because you have sin in your life. 
I don't think that's what it is. I think most of us, we don't come to the altar because we're not ready. We're not ready to surrender the battle. We're not ready to surrender the battle of pride, the battle of raising my kids, the battle of my finances, the battle of being a good spouse, the battle of my grief, the battle of me even trusting that God is who he says he is. This is a place to do battle. And on the other side of surrender is victory waiting for us. Faith thrives in holy discomfort. I'm not just inviting you this morning, I'm challenging you to come and do battle to put your faith in a place of holy discomfort. The victory is right here. Surrender the battle to the Lord today. Second Corinthians 12, nine and 10 says this, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Surrender the battle this morning. There's victory.
Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the whole. It's that power that conquered sin and death that we have hope. See 
This song is an anchor for our faith. Jesus Christ is our living hope. I mean, did the words of that last song just move you or what? That we can speak the name of Jesus over our families, that we can speak the name of Jesus into the darkness, that we can speak the name of Jesus into our failures, into our fears. There's power in the name of Jesus. And this song that we're singing right now is why. God, in my own life, there have been times that I have doubted. There have been times when I have failed to trust you. And yet through the darkness, your loving kindness tore that veil. And you showed your glory yet again. You are our living hope. And Father, I pray every, over everyone in this room this morning, God, those who have come to the altar, those who have been anointed, those who are just in their seats, just praying. Speak to our hearts today, God. We are here to celebrate in worship this morning for what you have done. Don't let us miss an opportunity today. We give you the honor and the glory, our living hope. Amen. Let's worship together, church. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the
Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Sing it, church. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, your A great message. Uh, I've been fortunate uh, to be connected with some really uh, powerful uh, men in my life. Uh, and we get a chance to share text threads once in a while. And we've come to the habit of not just, hey, how was your day? Or hey, you know, how's the family? Or hey, how's this? Or hey, how'd this go? But we've gotten into a habit of just sending prayers through our texts. When somebody has a need, we don't wait. We just start praying through our fingers, through our voice. Um, and, uh, and this past week, I had a chance to actually send a text to a brother. And in that text, as we're speaking this morning on the message, somehow it came out, I'm praying that you will become comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I look back over that, and I kind of marinated on that because I want to be uncomfortable. Uh, I want to become comfortable with God making me uncomfortable to where it's just, it's comfortable knowing that I'm uncomfortable, and God's just going to keep pushing me in different directions. And so um, if you're new this morning and you're joining us, uh, we want you to be comfortable knowing that you might become uncomfortable at some <laughs> point, because we are a church of generosity. As the ushers come this morning, we believe uh, in that open hand mentality. When everything in us says, no, it's mine, and yet God says, no, it's, it's mine. And so as we uh, come this morning, we just want to remind you that we want to continue to live a life that we're called to of generosity. Father God, we thank you this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to, to worship as a body. Man, the Spirit is here. And yet we know when we leave, the Spirit is also there. You are everywhere. And so, Father, as we take a moment just to honor you with, with our gifts Will you use these to forward your kingdom in ways we don't even understand yet? In your name we pray, amen. We want to invite anyone 55 years and older to our Evergreen Club lunch on Sunday, October 30th in the Ephrata Campus Cafe at 11.30 a.m. If you are planning on attending, please RSVP at the sign-up sheet at the welcome desk or call the church office. 
On October 26th from 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m., we'll be having our annual Light of the Night at both the Ephrata and Lebanon campuses. If you would like to decorate a trunk for Trunk or Treat, you can sign up at the fire truck at the Ephrata campus or in the sanctuary at the Lebanon campus. On October 22nd, there will be a craft show at Grace Point to benefit the Grace Point Youth Group. The craft show runs from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. There will be more than 50 vendors. If you are able to help by donating food or volunteering your time, please sign up at the table in the foyer. Our next baptism service is taking place on October 30th. Contact the church office if you're interested in getting baptized. There will be a meeting for people getting baptized on Sunday, October 23rd, right after the church service in Kidstown. Would you just stand and join us as we close in the chorus of House of the Lord? We'll see you next time.